So I'm going to talk to you today about um, a, an idea that I guess every chemist wants, or non-chemist, is how we can have a drug factory in our basement. Um, you know Breaking Bad? That's, a, that's actually a joke. So what I'm really going to talk to you about is how we might digitize chemistry and what that might mean for chemistry, drug discovery, and ultimately how we as consumers of chemicals, and um, nothing is chemical free, they might be good, they might be bad, they might be desired, is important. So I'm going to talk to you about this idea of digitizing chemistry and why it might be important. So this is really potentially extremely boring, right? Because I start off talking about chemistry, and now I'm talking about digital computing. But if you bear with me for one mo moment, I'm going to try and put this in some context. So what we're going to try and do to chemistry is turn it into a programmable computer. To, to think about how we might do, do that, we should go back to the Turing machine. This is quite an apt room in which to do this. Now, the Turing machine is this theoretical construction, this theoretical object that could run any program. Now, we want to think about a chemical reactor or a, mod a magic saucepan that could make any molecule. Now, let's think about it for a second, right? What molecule do you want to make? And everyone's going, oh, you know, crystal meth, MDMA, cocaine. OK, maybe you're in. Uh, South Sudan and you want, a, you want a, a drug, or maybe you're on your way to Mars and you need a special antibiotic. Just think about that for a second. How can you get access to that? And can digitization give, give the route to get there? And so we kind of came up with this idea that we may think about computing and chemistry in a similar way, and we call this term computing. Now, it's, it's kind of a funny term because chemicals clearly don't compute, or do they? Can we program the way of making a molecule. So this brought the idea, well, I think you've seen a lot of the exhibits here, with lots of hacking, lots of drones, 3D printers, and so on. These have all become possible because computing is getting cheaper. But it's not just getting cheaper, the hardware is getting more accessible. So binary and code through the cloud is made really easy through very cheap processing um, hardware. So what we started to think about in my laboratory is, could we start to think about using a 3D printer like a chemist? So in the same way that you'll download a code and then print out an object, could we download a code and make a molecule that you might need urgently or might be important for a research uh, objective or allow us to make a formulation, maybe a cosmetic? So these are all the type of ideas that we've been playing with in the lab to try and figure out how we might do this digitization. Now, why would you want to do this? Now, I made jokes about um, um, crystal meth and, and so on. And really, our objective is not illicit pharmaceuticals. Our objective is universal access to medicine. So another thing I want you to think about, this probably doesn't really affect most people now who take digitization for granted. Go back 30 years. If you couldn't get that book from the library, or that book was out of print, how would you get it? Well, the answer is you couldn't. You'd have to go and look for that first edition, or someone who had a copy. Now, fast forward 30 years into the chemical world. There are only a finite number of factories on planet Earth that are making drugs. Okay? And those, drug, those factories shift from molecule to molecule as the patents change. So when you shift the entire facility from making, say, the 10 top pharmaceutical compounds, what happens to the previous 10? The code to make them is lost. And when the drugs run out, you can't get them anymore. So is this the correct way to run our chemical inventory, that the poorest part of the world can't afford medicine that's off patent because no one makes it? OK, there are some cheap ger generics that, that still go, but in general, most patented materials that when they go off, they're no longer made because it's not cost effective. So can we imagine a situation where we can get universal chemistry that will allow us just to pull down the code? In the same way, you've got your ebook reader, and anyone can publish anything now, and you can send it to your friends to read. The other point is that drug discovery takes a really long time. And I won't bore you here with the chemistry, but needless to say, it's a long time to go from making that molecule to then getting that molecule into the clinic, and then into the pharmacy. So can we cut down that time? So what I'm going to do now here is um, make a molecule, or they're going to press the button for me. And you're going to guess what molecule this is. We, no, you don't have to. 
But this molecule is being built up in steps, and all I've done is deleted all the bits. And it looks very complicated because it is, but it's actually a natural product made by the Pacific yew tree. It's called Taxol, and it is one of the most important anti-cancer drugs that exists, but it's really complicated to make. And why it's good is it happens to just restrict the blood vessel formation when you have a tumor, and it strangles the tumor, and the tumor dies. This molecule is extremely hard to make, extremely hard to come by because it requires many steps to make it. Now, what about if we could get a robot to make that molecule and use a digital code and reproduce it perfectly every time? Sadly, that's not possible, generally, at blue screens. Now, I'm not that old, but I'm still old enough to remember Windows blue screening. And you remember when, say, a system error has occurred. <laughs> Well, just, this happens in chemistry labs all the time. Let's read this. This system error has occurred. This reaction is not reproducible in your lab. Synthesis of Taxol failed at 15.2 revision. Crap. Chemical dump follows from memory. And if you look in there, synthesis failed two more months. And the bottom line is that the drugs, not only do the drugs not always work, but the chemistry to make them is not always universally reproducible. I mean, would you accept, if you downloaded an app and run it on your phone, that it would only work half of the time? Now, why do apps work on your phone? Well, if you take, well, they're, they're compiled to the architecture. So the person that's doing the programming has a kit that understands how the architecture works and error checks it and gets most of the bugs out. And most of the time, the software runs on the hardware. And all we're doing in the lab is trying to say, how can we change our hardware so that we can exchange code to make molecules. And could we use that to help us um, digitize chemistry and also make molecular discovery easier? But when you have discovered it, then because you have that code, and it's a, it's a very tangible piece of code that works every time, why not just use that to manufacture it in smaller amounts more reliably? And in my lab in the past few years, we've been making all this really complicated spaghetti chemistry and going from this alchemist bench, if you like, to this very sophisticated microfluidic system for the making of molecules. And if you're a chemist geek or a computer geek or a micro geek, then you'll love this. But most people will say, well, look, at the bottom line is, I don't really like chemistry. I failed it at school. But can you just make sure it works and I can get access to the molecule formulation that I need? He said, well, can we come up with an analog to digital chemistry in this idea of computing? And we've been doing this in my lab and also in the company that we've started called Cronin Group PLC, where the aim is to design and then discover and digitize the process. And the basic idea is that chemistry is old. Robotics has been used a lot in chemistry, but it's very expensive. But by using a universal approach to chemistry, can we develop a chemical internet? So go to the lab give the students some 3D printers and say, do chemistry with them. And this is what we did a few years ago. And you can see them building riprap's here. Now, why on earth would you build a 3D printer in a chemistry lab? Well, wouldn't it be interesting if you could use the 3D printer to 3D print a test tube with a particular shape, and then use a 3D printer like an automated cocktail maker, and move the liquids in the right order, in the right way, so you, you know whether it's been shaken or not stirred. stirred. So literally, the chemistry can be programmed by the robot, and you don't have to care. All you care about is um, basically making sure that the hardware and the software and the wetware are working together. So we started this to ask, could we literally make molecules in a 3D printer? Now, we are not 3D printing a molecule using FDM, as uh, the, was mistaken by a couple of journalists who got really excited that you, know, you can just go and 3D print a molecule. But we are using a code in a 3D printer or a 3D printer-like robot to basically make the test tube and then add the liquids. And I'll describe that in a bit more detail in a moment. So how do you go from 3D printing to chemical robotics? Well, when I gave um, a talk a few years ago, I speculated that we could basically make ibuprofen using a 3D printer. And here is a robot that we've designed using, a, using the riprap. And you can see that there is some plastic architectures there that have been made by extrusion. And then we've got these syringes that add the chemicals. And in this device, we can actually make 
ibuprofen. And literally, you could put this robot in a suitcase, take it anywhere in the world. As long as you have the input chemicals, which are, in this case, relatively simple, you press a button with the code, and you make ibuprofen every time. So how would this change the way we think about chemistry? What is the universal computer? Well, this is boring, but, but kind of important. Um, the, the, the valve transistor worked many, many years ago. And then it was conceptually possible to design a processor as complex as the processor you have in your phone and your computer. What is the minimal unit of chemistry that we can daisy chain together to modularize it so that we can do chemistry in, over many, many steps and make really large molecules and in the same way that we can make very, very um, um, uh, sophisticated processes that can do many calculations per second. So this is what we're trying to do at the moment, to make the thing modular and universal. In this case, the ibuprofen robot is now shown here, but you've got the, chemist the crazy chemistry in the left-hand side, but can you see in the center there, human-readable, machine-readable pieces of code? Number one, fabricate stage reaction vessel. Deposit in the solution of A, add in the solution of B, stir, add solution C, stir fabricate the second reactor, withdraw stage one, and so on. So even those of you that flunked chemistry could follow the code and get the product out. And even if you don't want to do it, you just have the robot to do it for you. And I think this is a key concept that I want to try and convey here today, is that you can codify chemistry and then make it available as long as the hardware is cheap enough. But let's now go to discovery. And drug discovery, and not only now, we're going to talk about formulation discovery. So here is a robot that we built to look at salad dressing, to ask, can we, by digitizing the addition of the salad dressing, can we find something interesting? And in, on the right-hand side there, you can see droplets that have all these really strange behaviors. But these droplets only have four chemicals in them, only four. And by varying those four, you get ones that explode, move, they wobble to music, if you really want. And so you get these really interesting discoveries that occur in this formulation space. And I think it's quite apt, given the introduction to this materials kind of section, that we can not only use the digitization of kind of hard-sounding chemical reactions, but we can physically make objects that will release molecules, release drugs, or maybe use for formulation for cosmetics. And it happens by combining the chemistry and the robotics together. The ultimate aim is to produce a device a bit like this, where we fabricate the reaction vessel according to a code that we can give to one another. And then not only do we have that code for the vessel, but we can then add in the chemicals, as is described here. But even more interesting than that, you could have a cell culture at the bottom and you could then start to screen your particular mixture of chemicals that would be correct, maybe if you had an infection and you wanted to choose the right antibiotic. So the idea that we want to kind of get round to thinking about making happen is this idea of download a drug, then press print. Anyone with a 3D printer could become a chemist. Well, again, I'm not really sure that that's that this is published in New Scientist, a popular science magazine in the UK. I'm not sure that that's what we ultimately want to happen right now, but it is so thought-provoking, it allows you to think about the decentralization. So, no, not everyone with a 3D printer and internet connection, but imagine a, pharmac a pharmacist would now be able to make the molecules on-site according to what you need um, um, in the prescription. This changes supply chains quite a lot. It also starts to say that we don't necessarily need to rely on big manufacturing facilities anymore, and that we can make all of chemistry available as a function of the smaller molecules that we can buy. And all you need is a 3D printer or a small robot that can fabricate the hardware and then add in the chemistry. Then the chemists start to become app developers. Because if I can now make a molecule in my lab, Normally, I try and keep it secret for as long as possible, because I want to see if it's really interesting. I want to basically publish it. 
But the problem with keeping it secret, and the chemists, don't get me wrong, chemists aren't trying to keep it secret from the world. They're obviously just trying to make sure they've done it properly. But in this bespoke kind of Michelin star chemist world, reproducibility is a problem. Because not only do we want to make a new molecule, we want to make, make, be able to make sure that other people can reproduce it. And normally, that's a function of the, um, the level of education or the expert chemist that you have to do it. So if we could make it um, a, a give an incentive to the chemist to app their molecule. So if I discovered a molecule in my lab today, and I validated its existence and could purify it and put it on the cloud, you could download it tomorrow, make it, and use it for your application. And that might change the way that we think about how we do chemistry, not only in the chemistry lab, but maybe outside of the chemistry lab in the biology lab, and therefore critically change the way that we think about molecular collaboration. And then, yeah, maybe one day we might use it for formulation. I could imagine doing, putting one of those in your kitchen. I'm not sure that I could imagine making drugs in your kitchen for obvious reasons. So in my, the reason we started to do this in my group is that we're obviously interested in making new molecules in discovery. But what we're really trying to do is look at molecular and chemical complexity. The flip side of this is how does a biological system emerge from nothing on planet Earth? And how, from, from the bottom up, to get a look at the origin of life? And how, from the top down, can we digitally control molecules and make new drugs and formulations and complex systems. So it's on that note that I want to finish and just to kind of um, convey to you that maybe one day you will be downloading digital code to take to Mars or to take maybe on a long holiday where you're not going to have any physical connection to the world to, to, to give yourself access to the molecules that you need. It's about the cost the logistics, and also trying to think about what we need as users, as customers to chemistry, rather than what is available because of the fact that we only have a limited number of factories making the molecules that we need every day. Thank you very much.